Well, Purple Gang, um, Purple Gang is a uh, Jewish gang of Jewish men in between 1925 and 35 is when they are the most prominent and not even all of that time, but that, that covers sort of the uh, inside outside dates of how they are, or when they are prominent in, in Detroit. Uh, we see 13 men here um, and uh, that represents probably 25% uh, of the gang. Uh, it was felt that they were, um, it was the 50 to 100 men, but actually a, uh, 1930, in 1932, a Detroit detective had a list of men that he had kept their names and he had 49 on that list when he retired. And so probably 50 is the top of what the gang was on a regular basis. They would bring in people from the outside. But the main gang members were Jewish boys, mostly from Detroit, but from other cities too. Um, during Prohibition, they used hijacking, which they used more than anything else to get their booze. Uh, bootlegging, rum running, extortion, and murder. Uh, they had a racing wire, which uh, eventually we're going to find comes, comes to be the last thing that they actually have before they basically go out of business. Um, they were not tall. They were short generally between 5'3 and uh, between, yeah, between 5'3 and about 5'8, uh, age 23 to 28. Uh, one of the guys actually um, was called the gorilla and he actually was only five feet tall and weighed hundred pounds, but he was so vicious he picked up that name. Some of the other names were uh, Abraham, Abby the Agent Zussman, Two Gun Harry Altman, One Arm Mike Gelfland, and Mike did literally have one arm. He lost it as a child. Uh, so it didn't happen during the uh, Prohibition period and the other gang wars they got involved in. Um, Isidore Uncle Izzy Kaminsky and Zygmunt Ziggy Fingers. And we're going to find out what the term, where the uh, term Ziggy Fingers came from. Zygmunt Ziggy Fingers Selbin. Okay. Now the name. In 1918, uh, it was uh, quoted several times that two grocers who had probably had things out on in front of their their um, stores on Hastings, and we're going to go there there shortly uh, on Hastings Street because that's where the purples came from that area. Um, that they said of these boys, because the boys would come along and steal fruit from the stands and shoplift in the stores. He said, these boys are tainted. They're off color. Yeah, they're purple. That's why they are. That's what they are. Purple, like bad meat. They're a purple gang. And that's in 1918. One of the other possibilities is some people said that uh, at one point in time, the boys would skip school and go out to Lake St. Clair and they all had purple swimming suits. Well, they didn't have much money, so that's probably not too likely. Uh, purple boxing trunks. There was one of the purple gang named Eddie Fletcher who had come from New York. And in, when he was in New York, he was a boxer. He was only 5'3", weighed 130 pounds. And um, his record wasn't too good. We're gonna find out later, but there was that possibility that, that it was used, uh, or the idea that uh, the purple boxing trunks came, that's where the, the, the uh, name came from. Uh, a man named Sam Cohen, who was called Sammy Purple, uh, was that a possibility of the name? Finally, I can tell you that in 1929, uh, basically the men in the picture you just saw were arrested and reporters asked him, so what's with this uh, pur purple gang name? And one of them, Joe Honey Miller said, I don't know what's going on. Who, who got up that name? So they didn't see themselves as the Purple Gang. It was more what the newspapers did. And in 1928, that's the first time they actually show up in the, the term Purple Gang shows up in print. So you get an idea. So Hastings Street in 1911, this is what it looked like. Um, we've got uh, the, this delicatessen. There were also, um, um, groceries and shoe repair. And this is in, in on Hastings Street. Where is Hastings Street today? Hastings Street is I-75 south of I-94. It's a freeway there now, right in the center of that. That's where Hastings Street was. And that's why it's gone today because it was taken out basically when they put in the freeway in the 50s. Um, it was called Little Jerusalem because there was a heavy, heavy Jewish population there. We know this is 1911 because if you look off to the side, you will see Saturday, December 30th, 1911 right here on uh, the uh, board out in front of it. Uh, 
Little Jerusalem was defined by uh, Willis on the north, Gratiot on the south, Rush on the east, and Russell on the further east. Uh, Russell on the west, Brush on the east. This is not Eastern Market. It, it goes up against Eastern Market with Russell Street, but it was not in. Uh, it was not considered an Eastern Market at that point in time. So. These are streets like, so this is what the purples look like in the, in the period probably 1916 to 1920. Uh, this is not a picture of the purples. It's just a picture that I found online, which really typifies though what they would have looked like at the time. Um, early teens, late teens, um, steal from push carts, they're shoplifting, they're running protection rackets and extorting kids money, so they're like their lunch money, but and small crimes. They picked up gambling after school. And where did they go to school? They went here. The Bishop Union School had been built in the 1850s. Um, this was an alternative school. If you couldn't make it in the other school, this is where you ended up. They didn't call it an alternative school. It was a gradeless school, didn't have grades in it. Um, and it was the kids who did not fit in the public schools. So it's an alternative school like we know today. Uh, actually, there's a trade school next door. So if you even got bumped out of the Bishop Union School, you went, you could go to the trade school. Um, this was on Winder and Rivard. So think of north of the, uh, the two stadiums, Comerica Park and Ford Field, and then further east and also north of the Ford Freeway, but east of 75. That's where the Winder, that's where the Bishop Union School and the guys, like I said, learn to gamble playing craps in the schoolyard. The Sugar House Gang. Actually, what happens is the uh, Purple Gang, the, guy, the guys that are in the Purple Gang, start out with the gang at the Bishop Union School. And what happens is uh, this gang eventually involves, evolves into spending time at the Oakland Sugar House. So what is a Sugar House? Sugar House is a place where you get your supplies for your home brew. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But basically, as you go into Prohibition, it's the, the selling and, and transportation of liquor is illegal, but you can make 200 gallons of wine from uh, grapes. And so you can have it. So you could have this in your house. You could have the things to make beer and liquor in your house. You just couldn't get caught. That was the thing. The Bishop Union boys were the boys that came out of the Bishop Union School, which we've just seen. And initially they call it themselves the Sugar House Gang because that's where they're hanging out. The Oakland Sugar House is run by two Jewish men. One was um, George Goldberg, the other was Isidore Cantor. And they ran the Sugar House and they, that they and other people in the Sugar House were teaching the, the Purple Gang guys how to pull off crimes. And what are we saying here? The finer points of crime, meaning the, the um, hijacking, robbery, arson, extortion, and murder. By the way, I'll throw a question out. You don't, you can't obviously answer it, but what are, where did the term hijacking come from? Well, it starts during the 1920s when men would step out in front of a truck that they knew that there was brewed booze in it. And they would go around and then the guy, the truck driver would stop. They go around to the driver's side and say, hi, Jack. They didn't know what his name was, but, but that was just a common name. So hi, Jack. And that's where the term hijacking comes from. During prohibition, they're stopping guys. And if you got stopped by the purple gang, you better give up the truck. Because if you gave any kind of, uh, that you were going to resist it anyway, you would have been shot and killed immediately with no questions. Uh, payoffs. Uh, the people, uh, some of the revenuers that were actually working for the government to stop prohibition uh, were, what they would do is they would bribe. They would bribe police. Police were bribed. Everybody was bribed, basically. So what kind of a bribe was it? Well, uh, guys would make $1,800 a year to be a revenuer. The bribes would be $1,800 a week. So you can see why guys would actually take the payoff. Oakland Sugar House, as you can say here, this is Oakland Avenue. Uh, named, by the way, because it runs north to Oakland County. That's how it got its name. 
Uh, this is where the sugar house was. It's not there anymore. That's just empty land now. Uh, 8634 Oakland, you can see I-75 over here. Uh, so this is where Hastings would have been, Hastings Street. And here's Holbrook. This is your exit where you get off 75 and about six blocks to the east, you're gonna be in Hamtramck and be at Joseph Campbell and Holbrook. And that's how you go to Hamtramck or I go to Hamtramck, especially these days. One of the guys that ran the sugar house was Henry Shore. And he was one of two owners. I said, Mr. Goldberg, Mr. Cantor ran it. Well, what happens is uh, in 1924, Mr. Cantor is killed. George Goldberg is so afraid he literally leaves town and, and is, hides out in the Upper Peninsula. And so Henry Shore uh, was one of the guys that took over the, the Oakland Sugar House and taught the boys all those robberies, arson, et cetera, sort of uh, the finer points of crime sort of thing. Uh, he just worked in the Sugar House before, but when, uh, beginning probably in 1919 or so, and then in 1924, uh, Goldberg was... Uh, he ran away because he was afraid and his uh, partner Cantor, Isidore Cantor, um, actually um, was killed. Uh, there were other gangs around, uh, by the way. I didn't tell you it uh, otherwise. There was the, uh, in Greek town, Jimmy the Greek Thompson, who's, who was around for many years, ran the Greek town area. Downtown was neutral territory. Downtown was neutral territory during the gang area. This is during prohibition. Prohibition is from 1920 to 1933, and we'll have a slide on that shortly, but just to back up a little bit here, to let you know that they weren't the only gang in town. Uh, the biggest gang, of course, was this East Side gang, were the Sicilians, the mafia. And they were always the strongest, but they were, they were quiet, they kept quiet. The Purples made a big deal out of everything, and that's why we know about them today. Uh, there was a uh, gang in Corktown, uh, which were the Irish. And in Midtown, there was another gang. And in the Southwest, down by Del Rey, there was another gang. So what happens is the uh, Purple Gang basically gets the north and north part of the city is theirs. And that's how the gangs would have worked. They all had territories and they occasionally would cooperate, but many times not. And we're going to see when they don't. Charles Leiter is another one of the um, owners of the uh, Oakland Sugar House. Um, again, they took over uh, after the, the Goldberg and Cantor had uh, left the, the, uh, the sugar house. Um, he, he actually, Charlie Leiter, actually survives Prohibition. That doesn't happen to many of the Purple Gang. And I'll be going into that in, in more detail. Uh, late in the 1940s, a, a Detroit News uh, reporter found him. And he was in a bar that he owned in Detroit. And he says, this is what he said. I work 15 to 18 hour day in this joint. I never go anywhere else. Just a schmuck selling beer. Well, Charlie Leiter, and uh, I want to tell you as many as I can about the different Purple Gang people. Um, he actually got married, had a son, which is rare. Most of the Purple Gang, some were married. Many were married, but uh, we're going to find out that more and more about that. He had a son who actually died in 1970 before Charlie Leiter died himself in 1984. Um, he is buried in a Jewish cemetery in Birmingham, Clover Hill Park Jewish Cemetery in Birmingham. We're going to find most of the Purple Gang guys that were killed uh, or just died of normal causes later on in their life. Are, are act we're actually buried in Jewish cemeteries. So we've got, got the coming of Prohibition. Prohibition comes along in 1920. Uh, just to give you some basic background, WCTU means the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Starts in 1873, and what it says is uh, the alcohol is destroying families, and, and so women are against it because the men get drunk, they come home, and they beat their wives, or they beat their children, or they spend all their money on alcohol, and the family has nothing for food and, and shelter. Uh, business favored prohibition. There was strong rural support. Uh, Michigan actually voted prohibition in the state itself in 1918. In the 19th Amendment, which is the amendment that set up prohibition, um, uh, forbid the importation, sale, and transport of al al alcohol was illegal, but not consumption. Didn't mean they're going to stop you from drinking it. You just couldn't be caught in a bar in a, a blind pig. Um, 200 gallons uh, you could make a year with wine of wine or cider, and so as a result, the Oakland Sugar 
cows can do well because they're saying to people, well, you can get your, your basic stuff here. And they're also supplying huge amounts of basic uh, stuff to make the booze or to make the beer to the criminals. January 17th, 1920, prohibition begins. And it's 20, it's 1920 to 1933. Prohibition was 14 years. If you thought it was a couple of years and then it was over, no, it was a long, long time. And the gangs took over really quick. Within hours of prohibition starting literally at midnight, January 17, 1920, you've got rum runners going across the river with booze. Who are the leaders of the Purple Gang? The leaders were the Bernstein brothers. And notice I've underlined the word Bernstein there. That's because there's a couple different spellings. Um, first off, uh, the Bernstein family, Sam Bernstein, is not at all related to the Bernsteins of the Purple Gang. Not at all. Nothing. They both, they're, both of their families came from New York at certain times, but they both had been actually born in different places in Europe even. So Abe Bernstein is the oldest. He was born in 1891 and uh, he was 29 when prohibition started. Uh, as soon as they came to the, the, the family came to the United States in 1902. And as soon as they got here, Abe at this point is 11. He goes to school for a short time and he says, nah, I don't wanna go to school. And he starts selling papers on the street. He learns how to fight and therefore let's pick that part up at least. Um, in 1910, he goes to work for Ford at the Highland Park plant and stays there for about three years. But he's got a side job working in a uh, illegal gambling place and he's a dealer there. And that's what ends up being his actual life um, career, if you would say, in gambling. Uh, he's meeting the um, main leaders of the city of Detroit in gambling dens like this, like uh, which were prevalent at the time, especially during Prohibition, because you, you would have the gambling and the booze at the same place. And um, he leads the Purple Gang. 29 is, as Prohibition starts, so he's the, both, he's the oldest of the Bernstein brothers. The second Bernstein brother is Joey, who was born also in Russia in 1899. He's 20, excuse me, he's 21 as Prohibition starts. Uh, dropout of the Bishop Union School. Um, he's at the Sugar House a lot, learns arson and hijacking and car theft, how to pickpocket, all of that at, at uh, the uh, Sugar House. And he is a major part of the Purple Gang. We're gonna find out about these guys as they go further on in life too. Ray Bernstein, uh, and most of these are literally mug shots as you can probably see. Um, he's the first one of the Bernsteins born in the USA in 1903. He's 17 when Prohibition starts and uh, he's Joey's right hand in the Bishop Union boys. And then when, then when they become the Sugar House gang, that's the, he's like the, the second in command under Joe. At, when Abe is on the top. Um, so we've got one more Bernstein brother, Isidore, Izzy Bernstein. He was born in the USA in 1906. So that made him 14 as Prohibition comes in. Um, he actually goes to the Bishop Union School and graduates. Of the brothers, he's the only one that actually graduates from high school. Uh, but he joins the Sugar House Gang probably around 1922, which would have been 16 or 17 years old at that point in time for him. A couple more people we want to keep in mind. Eddie Fletcher. Eddie Fletcher is at, and he comes from New York. Actually born in Russia initially. And a lot, a lot of the Russian Jews went to New York as their basic stopping off point. Some stayed, some moved on. And um, the Bernsteins were ones that moved on. Eddie comes to Detroit at a later time. Born in Russia in 1898, uh, he was a boxer, uh, 5'3", 130 pounds. Between 1920 and 1923, when he was actually professionally boxing, he had a 14 and 13 record. So not so good. Um, at some point in time, he decides to go to Detroit. And in 1925, he shows up and hooks up with the Pur Pur excuse me, Purple Gang. He was a hitman for the Purple Gang, one of the best. Uh, very happy-go-lucky, they say. He was a great guy, good talker. And another one of the Purple Gang who comes from New York is Abe Axler. 
Abe is actually born in New York City in 1901. So we're getting some of the men for the Purple Gang who are actually born in, in uh, the USA. Uh, the family comes over right around 1900. His was there earlier. He's 19 when Prohibition starts. Um, he's in New York City. He's doing muggings, assaults, armed robbery. Uh, and things got quite, quite hot for Abe Axler and, and his cousin Simon. Uh, so he follows Eddie Fletcher to Detroit. Um, again, one of the, the best of the hitmen. Uh, he was, so as Eddie is happy and go lucky. Abe Axler is quiet and morose. And together, Eddie and Abe were called the Siamese twins. So Eddie Fletcher on the left, Abe Axler on the right. And the, these two guys were the best hitmen for the Purple Gang. Harry Millman. Harry is actually born in Detroit in 1911. So in the 1930 census, he's still living at home. And uh, he's 19. He graduates. He another one is another one that actually graduated from the Bishop Union School. And, but he joined the Purple Team, Purple Gang right out of school. Uh, he was excellent at protection, and I get that from his great niece. And she said he was excellent at protection. He was known to be a big drinker, big fighter, and a ladies' man. So what happens to the Purple Gang? How do they start getting involved in crime in Detroit? Okay, this is the beginning of the Purple Gangs uh, moving up the ladder, if one would say, in the criminal uh, area of Detroit. The Cleaner and Dyers War between 1925 and 1928. Yes, it is cleaners. So the wholesale cleaners and, and dyers, I'm not saying dryer because I frequently say that to myself as I'm doing this. It's D-Y-E-R-S. Uh, according to the best book on the purples called Off Color, um, in 1920s, washers were not yet popular. And so many people took their clothes to cleaners and dyers to get them clean or get them dyed different colors. and there was a war between the wholesale plants that actually did the work. So tailors and cleaners like we know today would send their, would take in the cleaning and send it to the wholesale plant, which would actually do the work. So what happens is there's a price war going on. So they, they finally decided these, these uh, wholesale plants, there's only about seven of them. And they decided, well, we need to get organized so we can set a stable price. So they bring in an organizer from Chicago, a labor organizer, and they put together a a plan where they'll, they'll have a group that's basically a labor organization, except it's it's actually the owners of these um, wholesale plants that do the actual cleaning and, dry, and dyeing. Um, so once it's organized, the labor uh, man goes back to Chicago and leaves in charge a man named Charles Jacoby, who just happened to be the son-in-law of A. Bernstein. So the Purple Gang can move into this quickly. So the Purple Gang's job was to harass any of the non-joiners, uh, anybody that doesn't join. A couple of uh, new wholesale plants start up and they're actually bombed and burned by the Purple Gang. And in 1928, 12 of the Purple Gang are actually tried for extortion. And uh, they're actually acquitted though. So the Purple Gang, oh, wow, see, we, can, we, we aren't even going to be convicted. We're going to get away with it. This is the beginning, Cleaners and Dyers of War is the beginning of the prominence uh, and the dominance of the, of the Purple Gang. Of uh, Miller Apartments. These are apartments that are on the east side of Detroit. And um, there were three men that were kind of come to Detroit. They're independent, they'd come from Chicago. Frank Wright, Joe Bloom, and George Cohen. Uh, they did muscle work for the Purples, and they also did some kidnapping and ransom where they would kidnap um, rich people, hold them ransom, get the money, and just release the people. Problem is that when they did one of these kidnappings, they had killed one of the affiliates of the, the Purple Gang. The Purples wanted retribution. And so the word went out to these three guys that, they're, that they should come to the Miller Flores apartment and, and um, they could re retrieve their kidnapped friend. Where is the Miller Flores department? The, the Miller Flores apartments were uh, basically on the entrance to Harper Hospital today off of Woodward. 
So it's on Alexandrian, 106 Alexandrian, and it's the Harper Hospital entrance today. So the three men went to the Miller Flores and they were gonna to go to apartment 305. And this is what they got. And as they're going towards 305 and knocking on the door, Three men come tumbling out of the, actually four men come tumbling out of the, uh, that apart, apartment 398, or I'm sorry, 308, and um, pull out a Tommy gun and uh, uh, shotguns, and the men were killed. The three men were killed there. Who was it, actually? It was the Siamese twins, Eddie Fletcher and Abe Axler, uh, a man from St. Louis called Fred Killer Burke, and Joe Honey Miller, who was a Purple Gang man. This is the first use of a Tommy gun in Michigan. It is establishing the reputation of the purples. Do not mess with the purples or they will wipe you out. And so they start to build their, their um, reputation in, in Detroit from this sort of thing. Tommy gun, it's the um, John Thompson, it's the Thompson submachine gun is what it's called really. John Thompson was a former general. He realized uh, that as World War I was going on, that the Americans were being cut up by the German, uh, the Germans were the first to bring in the um, um, submachine guns, although they were mounted on tripods. And so he comes up with a uh, gun. This is it, the Tommy gun. And it was built for World War I, but by the time they literally produced enough to actually send them to war, the war was over. It used 45 shells, those are large shells. It had a 20 um, shell uh, clip, or you could get 50 or 100 round drums. And that's what we see here. The drum is right here. That's it. Um, the thing weighed 20 pounds fully loaded with, with a 10, with 100 pounds, with a 100 round drum, round drum. Uh, your AR-16 today only weighs about seven pounds to give you an idea. This thing could stop a, a moving car literally and turn it into Swiss cheese. So it was a very much of a killing gun. 1928, Vivian Welch. He was a um, Detroit cop. Uh, apparently at this time, the word Vivian or the name Vivian, I should say, was used both, both for women and men. Today, I, I think we generally, I generally at least look at it with the idea that generally this is a woman's name, but in this case, he. Uh, he come from the South, come from Alabama, joins the Detroit Police Department in 1923. And for about three years, he's a good cop. But by the time 28 rolls around, he is going to blind pigs that are being protected by the Purple Gang and shaking them down for more protection money. Well, the Purples get wind of this. And on January, 3rd, January 31st, 1928, uh, Vivian Welch gets in his car to go to work and it won't start, he gets out and realizes he's being chased by guys in another car and they chase him down and kill him in broad daylight. No one was ever convicted for this. And the whole idea is to establish fear of the Purple Gang. That's what they're doing. How about what else is going on? Well, guess what? Alphonse Capone, uh, born in New York um, in 1899. He goes to Chicago in 1919 as a 20-year-old and uh, took over the Chicago operation by 1925. And in 1928, he comes to, to Detroit with the idea that, well, maybe I'll move my operation and, and in, I'll, I'll uh, make it larger and I'll bring Michigan into it because I've got Chicago and I've got Illinois. Uh, well, he met with the Purples and he realized quickly because the Purples literally said to him, this is our river. You're not gonna get this, this is ours. And they basically told him, you stay out of Michigan, US 31, which is over by Kalamazoo, uh, is the border. And you stay west of 31 and everything will be fine. And Al said, okay, that's a deal. And they made a deal to, to ship to, uh, to Al Capone log cabin whiskey, which is a real excellent whiskey coming out of Canada. And at this time, uh, Al Capone's got competition and it's the Bugs Moran gang, gang the North Side gang. And his idea was to destroy the North Side Gang. And so in 1928, excuse me, in 1929, we have this company, SMC Cartridge Company, Valentine's Day, 1929, February 14th. So this is 2012 Clark Street in Chicago. And across the street, there was an apartment. 
who's in the apartment on Valentine's Day, but uh, the Siamese twins, Abe Axler and Eddie Fletcher, two more Purple Gang guys, want both brothers, Phil and Harry Keywell, Phil and Harry Keywell. And what's happening is this, uh, they had been told, Bugs Moran had been told, okay, there is a shipment coming in from Detroit for Al Capone, so uh, you, they, can be, they would be able to hijack it. And they said, okay, fine. So what's going to happen, what happens in is they send seven men in, they go into this SMC cartage and they're waiting for the hijacked truck to come and deliver the, the booze. After they're in there, shortly after, a car pulls up, four men get out, two men are cops and two men are in plain clothes. So they go inside, they line up the guys and with the Tommy gun and a rifle, they kill them right there, seven called the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And this is what it actually looked like. To show you how people though are interested in all kinds of things, uh, the building was to be torn down in 1967. After this, it was used for various things. This is 1929. So 50 years later almost, the building's gonna be torn down in Chicago. The guy in Vancouver says, oh, wow. He goes in and he buys the murder wall with all of the bullets against it. 406, 416 bricks, it's called the murder wall. Takes him up to Vancouver, opens a bar called the Banjo Palace and ran that from 1967 to 1971. Uh, that was closed down and the murder wall still exists. It's in Las Vegas in a place called the Mob Museum. So the six men, uh, six of the seven men are shown right here. This created a huge public outcry. Up till this time, the mobs were in basically seen as, okay, if they kill themselves, they don't kill other people, that's fine. But this was just too much. And so it gets the Chicago officials to have to decide that they have to take down Capone. And what they do eventually is they get him from tax evasion in 1931. So two years after the Valentine's Day massacre, Capone is sent to prison and um, he's uh, for in 1931, 11 years in prison. He's actually let out in 1938, excuse me, in 1939. He has, he's been diagnosed with venereal disease in 1938. He's also already starting to literally lose his mind. Uh, goes to his, uh, he has an estate on Palm Island in Florida in 1939 and lives there until 1947. Uh, many people think he died of venereal disease. He did not. He had a stroke in January of 1947. And um, then he had a heart attack. And was, he died from the heart attack, basically. But this is what the Purples are involved with. They are the guys in the apartment across the street. And they have identified what's, what's happened here is they've identified uh, a guy they thought was Bugs Moran. Bugs Moran came up shortly after this. He sees that what's going on here and he doesn't get out of his car and his car takes off. What happens is after the men are shot, the four men that went inside, two cops, two planes close, they come out and the planes close have the cops in handcuffs. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the cops have the plane clothes in handcuff with the idea that they've been arrested and they're gonna be taken in. So nobody would say, okay, the cops got these guys that did whatever happened in there. But in fact, it was phony, it wasn't real bugs. It was all Capone's guys. Now the Purples by 1929, again, they're starting in 28 is when they become more prominent. By 1929, they're, they're, they're starting to implode and I'm gonna explain this. Uh, something else that happens in the year 1929 is that um, the Siamese twins, Eddie Fletcher and Abe Axler actually uh, are convicted of uh, actually violating what was called the Jones Act, which was uh, another federal act in 19, uh, 29, the, the major, for, the, the major uh, prohibition act was the Volstead Act published in, uh, passed in 1920 that ran, that's, that was all the mechanics of, of prohibition and what was illegal and what would happen to people. The Jones Act came along in 29 and it was much more severe and uh, the Siamese twins were convicted under it and sent, and they spent two years in Leavenworth prison in beginning in July of 1929. But here's an example of the, the, uh, the, 
Purple Gang imploding in a way. Uh, Irving Shapiro was a gang member. Uh, he ran, he was good at extorting, extortion of blind pigs, in other words, paying for getting them to pay protection money. Um, and he was part of the group that was tried for the Cleaners and Dyers War. Um, what happens though is he gets to a point where he's doing some uh, kidnap ransom things and they, they kidnap a man, they say $25,000 and the man's family say, we only have $4,000. So they give the $4,000 to the guy. And Irving Shapiro was basically pushed out of the money. So he goes to, to take on other um, Purple Gang members and he is shot and killed. Nobody goes to his funeral, none of the Purple Gang. So they are, in other words, killing off the ones that are giving them problems. They don't want these, some of these people in there. Sorry. Zygmunt Ziggy Fingers Selbin. Uh, he was another one who was a friend of actually Shapiro. And when Shapiro is killed, Ziggy Selbin goes off the deep end. Why the name uh, Ziggy, Ziggy Fingers? Okay, this is what happened. At one point in time, before things happened in 29 to Selbin, who was actually killed, we're gonna find shortly. Uh, Ziggy actually goes, is, is at a, some blind pig somewhere, probably in the tw 1928 or so, 27 maybe. And he's drinking with somebody and he looks over and, and a, another man has a really great ring on. So Ziggy goes over and says, uh, can you give me your ring? And the guy says, no. And he asks again, the guy says, no. And finally, Ziggy shoots the guy and then tries to get the ring off, can't get the ring off. So he pulls out his knife and cuts the guy's finger off because he wanted the ring. Put the ring on his own finger and just casually dropped the guy's finger and walked off. Therefore the name Ziggy Fingers. Um, he is flips out when uh, Irving, Shapiro, Irving Shapiro, who we saw on the previous page uh, is uh, killed. And he starts to um, uh, hold up uh, blind pigs and go for them protection. And again, the, the, the uh, um, purples have to take care of them. At this time, we're in 1929 again. We're in like the middle of 1929. And what happens is at this point, after the St. Valentine's Day massacre, uh, the, the, gang, the gangsters are not seen anymore in a romanticized type of thing. Before this, they were seen, well, if they just kill each other, that's all right. But now it's more, it's more than just romanticized. And there's a crackdown going on in Detroit. Another incident that happened was Arthur Mixon. Uh, Arthur Mixon was a 16-year-old African-American boy who was delivering ice. You still had to use ice sometimes in your freezers and that uh, which we don't use today. And what happens is he comes in July of 1930, he's delivering his ice and, and he his friends are playing ball as they go down the street and he delivers his ice. And the ball goes under the, a partially open garage door. Well, what happens is uh, that's one of the cutting plants for the purples. In other words, they're cutting booze. What happens is by 1930, the bridge and the tunnel have been built and there's not as much booze coming across the river. So what happens is the, the purples set up various plants in the city to cut the booze, which means for every, at least for every quart, you're going to get two quarts out of that. So you cut it, and it's, it's gonna make more money for you. That's the way, that's what cutting is. So Mixon actually happens to, the ball runs under, he goes and he gets the ball and he's looking under the, the garage door and out comes this guy, Phil Keywell. And um, he talks to uh, Mixon, so what are you doing? Mixon mouths off a little as far as Keywell thinks and Keywell pulls out his, his gun and shoots him. Um, Keywell is convicted and he's the first purple convicted of murder. So the gang is falling apart. I mean, they're not, they don't have the, um, the continuity to, to stay together at this point. One of the things that happened about with Phil Keywell, he goes to, uh, first he goes to Jackson. And by 1950, he has become a trustee and he gets himself transferred to Dehoko, okay? Detroit House of Correction, which is again, over on Five Mile. And while he's there, Daily, he goes over and he manages the chicken farm at Mayberry Park, at Mayberry Sanitarium, I should say, sanatorium. And so that's a connection with Northville. Well, people hear about this, say, whoa, wait a minute, we don't want this um, murderer. And he is eventually put, sent back to Jackson. Uh, he's actually, his sentence, sentence is commuted in 1965 and he uh, goes straight. He may have married a woman and, and, and had a regular straight job until he died 
sometime before 1993, maybe in 1978, or he may have gone, when he got out of prison in 65, went and found some more of the Italian gang who had taken over the Purples at that point and um, went with them. It's not clear on that, but Phil Keywell was one of the ones that survived by being in prison, basically. And when he got out, he went straight. Ah, okay. This is going to be called the Collingswood Massacre. There's three guys that have come from out of town. Um, Leibowitz, Paul, and Sutker. And they, the, what happens is they were introduced, they came from Chicago. They're basically, Capone told them to leave Chicago. And so they were allowed into the Purple Gang. And a man that, that introduced them to the Purple Gang was named Sally Levine. Solomon Levine, Sally Levine. Uh, they do hijacking, they do counterfeiting. Um, they run booze back and forth across the river. This is in the 20s initially. And they're around and they borrow money from the purples, but they don't pay the purples back. And uh, <clears throat> so what the purples say is, all right, uh, they tell Sally Levine, tell these guys, these three guys, they were called the three terrors because whenever they, they would kill just as much as the purple gang would kill. He said, uh, uh, so Ray Bernstein said to Sally Levine, tell your friends, the, the terrors, to meet us, we'll meet before the 1931 American Legion Convention uh, in Detroit. And um, as soon as you, you pay back the money and after that, everything will be fine. He said, okay. So um, in 1931, these three men go to meet at the Collingswood Manor. This is an apartment on the uh, east side of Detroit. And, and what happens is that there's four purples. Ray is one of them. They go in, they meet with the three guys and at a sign, um, the purples pull out their guns and start shooting. At this point, Ray Bernstein has already left. He went down to get, gets in his car and revs it up and revs it up until it backfires. And that's the sign. So the three other purples who are Irving Milberg, Harry Fleischer, and Harry Keywell, and I'm gonna, we're going to show them shortly, so you don't have to try and remember the names. Um, they may immediately open on, on the, the three guys from out of town, the outsiders, as I call them. And this is what it looked like. So we've got a man here, a man here, and one over here. And a better picture is this. Collingwood's Massacre is illustrated by the Detroit Times. Detroit Times is a newspaper that ran in Detroit from the early 1900s until 1961 and went out of business. So that's why you don't hear about it today. The, what happens is the Purples, uh, after the, the, uh, the shooting, they grab Solly and dump their guns in cans of paint because that was all planned because then they couldn't get prints off of it. And they take off. They grab Solly and they take off and they go downstairs and jump into uh, Ray Bernstein's car and off they go. But as they're pulling out, uh, a little boy is almost hit by their car. And then there's a truck driver who is right there where you can see them. So he has seen all this. 1931, this is September, 1931. Outside the Collingswood Manor, this is what it looked like when it was found out that the Purples had, uh, uh, had done this. Uh, the woman in the apartment below uh, where this happened, here's the shots, calls the super, bodies are discovered, cops are called, and... Um, they bring out Sally Levine in, in 24 hours. He, he uh, caves in, tells everything, all of what the Purples did. And then the Purples are arrested. What happens is, so we have Irving Milberg, Ray Bernstein, and Harry Keywell. There were actually four Purples. So Harry Fleischer, Harry Fleischer, is not caught. He's never caught for this, actually. And these three guys are tried and convicted by the end of 1931 and sent to Marquette, Marquette Max, Max Prison. And this was a major problem because they, they shouldn't have left Sally Levine alive. Sally Levine, by the way, disappears after this trial. And he ends up back in the US living under an assumed name. So he, but he disappeared, probably went to France at the time. So these are the, the purples that are um, sent to prison. Ray Bernstein gets a life sentence, uh, has a stroke in 1963. And from 31 to 63, so he's in prison for 32 years. 
uh, gets a medical, uh, gets out on a medical on 64, basically compassionate medical leave, and dies in 1966 at the age of 63. Um, uh, never married, never had any kids, but he's buried in a Jewish cemetery in Livonia, Bethel, on Six Mile in Livonia. Next one, Irving Milberg. <clears throat> Irving Milberg went to prison as, uh, with the purple with uh, Ray Bernstein and Harry Keywell. In 19, and does well, and in 1938, he has an operation for an obstruction in his, in his intestine and um, has peritonitis and dies in September of 1938. Also buried in a Jewish cemetery, Macapila in Ferndale. Harry Keywell, Harry, he is actually under 21 when he goes to prison because he's joined the gang very young. His prison time is, uh, he spends the prison time with, again, with Ray Bernstein, first in Marquette, and then they go back, then they go down to Jackson. We're going to hear about that shortly. Um, his sentence was commuted in October of 65. He gets a job, gets married, and ends up dying in Boca Raton, Florida, at the ripe old age of 86 in August of 1997. He is the last of the surviving Purple Gang to die, actually, 1997. Sally Levine, as I said, was uh, let go. Obviously, he wasn't involved. He was the major uh, witness and in the prosecution. Harry Fleischer, what happens to Harry? Well, again, he's not arrested. He's not convicted with the other purples. And he gets out in October 1965 uh, from another prison sentence after 15 years for murder, uh, not for not involved with the Collingswood, but just trying to kind of give you an idea of what, is, what happens to him. Um, and he's a model prisoner. He may have, as I said earlier, may have married and worked at a local steel company, Ewald Steel Company, and died in 1978 at the age of 75. Another story tells that he actually hooked up with the Italian gang, the Sicilians, out in Vegas after he left. So it's not clear about Harry. We're going to hear his name more. Ah, our, our Siamese twins. So the Collingwoods Massacre happened in 1931 in September. The Siamese twins in 1933. All right. In the fall of 1933, prohibition is going to end. As I said, it ends in 1933 in December. But by, by September, what happens is Franklin Roosevelt runs for president in 1932 on a repeal of prohibition amendment platform. And so he's elected and the platform is put through and um, the prohibition amendment is, uh, the repeal amendment is passed. Michigan is the first one to sign it, by the way. And so by the uh, fall of 1933, end of prohibition is in sight. It's gonna happen, they know. What happens to the twins? Well, they don't really have much of an income because they're broke at this point, both of them. This is 1933 and um, in November. And what happens is they have come back to Detroit after spending uh, the uh, winter in um, in Florida. And what happens though is they don't have any money and they're broke and their job as hitmen is basically gone. The, the Purple Gang is not killing people all over the place like it did before. And that was their job being hitmen. So what happens is they try to start a restaurant deal with the Italian mob and it doesn't work out. And then they borrow money from Abe Bernstein. A bad move. And they don't pay him back when he wants it. He says, I want it back. And what happens is finally on November 25th, 1933, which is the day before Thanksgiving that year, um, Axler and Fletcher are called by Harry Millman. Remember Harry Millman? We're gonna hear about him more too. Harry uh, sets up a meeting at a blind pig in Pontiac for like 11 o'clock. So the Siamese twins go out there and by 1.15, no Millman. So they decide to leave and two men come up and meet them and Axler and Fletcher get in the car and that's the last time they're seen alive. Within an hour or so, a West Bloomfield cop is checking on cars that are parked on Telegraph. Telegraph and uh, Corton Road, which is 16 miles west of uh, Woodward. And who's there? He, he thinks it's a couple of uh, kids making out in the back seat of the car and he opens the window, opens the door 
and it's Abe Baxler and Eddie Fletcher. They've been shot multiple times in the face and in the body. And um, whoever did it uh, took their hands and literally put their hands together like they were holding hands because they were so close and that was it. Uh, they are actually taken by their families back to New York, Elmont, New York, and buried in a uh, Jewish cemetery there called Beth David. The killers of the Siamese twins, it's projected that there was Harry Fleischer and Harry Millman who had actually set up the meet. Now, some, some uh, we're going to step back from that, the purple gang, purple gangs as much in much detail in North. Uh, there is one place, the old German church on Seven Mile and Napier. That's what it looked like. It's, this is on the northeast corner of uh, Seven Mile and Napier. Called the old German church. Actually, as early as 1860, a congregational church is there. We have uh, that on maps of the 1860 of the Northville Township. And um, then in um, 1874, 1894, uh, they, the uh, congregation will apparently sell the church to the First Evangelical Lutheran Society of Salem, and they take it over. And from then on, it's, uh, it it's actually at some point in time then becomes a uh, house, which, which we know it today, and that's basically what it looks today. And the, the, it would, the purples were known to go out there for parties. And also, according to one of the local doctors, was asked, and he said, oh, yeah, they'd also come out to, to, to Northfield to get patched up, get the bullets pulled out, and get their, uh, their injuries treated. And this is what it looks like today. Away from Detroit, the Graceland Ballroom in Lupton, Michigan. Where is that? Lupton is, about, is uh, north of Saginaw, about 25 miles north of Saginaw. And it was built in the 1920s by our friend, Mike one arm Gelfland with $40,000 of the purple money. And he had it open uh, for the purples would meet there regularly. They'd have meeting, they'd, they'd meet there, they'd go to there to rest. Uh, Capone had, was there. This one burned down in 1981, but connected to the purple gangs and, and run by a former purple gang member. Club Manitou and Harbor Springs from 1929 to um, 1953. Uh, this was built with money from A. Bernstein, and it was fine dining on the upper floor and, uh, in 1929. This is a still during uh, Prohibition. And the basement, in the basement, there was booze and gambling. Uh, at that point in time, in the late 20s, Harbor Springs was known at the, as Naples of the North. It attracted a lot of people with money. Um, by the 1950s, there's local pressure from people living in the area. They want the place uh, uh, shut down, the gambling shut down at least. And in 1953, the liquor license is pulled. Uh, it never reopens. Uh, but from in the 60s, there's uh, rock acts in a thing called the Club Ponytail. And the whole thing burned down in March of 1969. So what happens to some of the other men in the Purple Gang? Henry Shore, again, is involved in the sugar house. They're supplying all of the uh, materials that are used to made, make booze. It's the basic mash, which is any kind of a grain and a sugar together, and they're going to produce alcohol. And the, if you put in corn sugar, it makes it all, all go faster. So that's the things that the sugar house is there. Henry Shore has a split with uh, Charles Leiter, who he was the other guy in the, uh, uh, the sugar house. And there was a problem with a crooked politician. And on de December the 3rd, 1934, Henry Shore, Shore goes out the door telling his wife, I'll be back pretty soon. Um, I'm gonna collect money for a guy that really needs the money. And so I'll, I'll just be a nice guy and do that. Henry Shore was never seen again. And uh, no one knows what happened to him. Um, he had a son named Moses who went by the name of Mickey. Mickey Shore, yes, he's the guy that was the DJ in Detroit and uh, has uh, audio car system or audio systems for cars. He had a, a chain of those. Actually, there's three stores that still exist today that are um, the Mickey Shore car audio systems. 
Abe Bernstein, well, in, in 1935, Abe Bernstein, we're still winding down the Purple Gang here, okay? Um, Abe Bernstein is, uh, in 1935, he's called in by the East Side Gang. And they're, again, the strongest guys around. At this point, the only thing that they, that the, that the Purple Gang had going for them is they, I mean, prohibition is over. We've got, there's no question about booze. We're not gonna be in the booze business anymore. So people like Abe are, are investing in other things. They've got breweries, et cetera, but also he has this wire, this racing wire. If anybody saw the, the movie, The Sting, uh, at the end, there's um, Newman and Redford are in this uh, supposed uh, con of a deal with a racing wire, and that's what it was. So the, the races would be projected, uh, would be uh, sent, the information on the races would be sent from the race tracks themselves and then guys like Abe Bernstein would get control of, of the um, that information out into his, his what they called the um, handbooks, and the, those were the actual bets were. And so Bernstein was called in by the Sicilian gang and said that the Sicilian gang said we're taking over the wire service, and you can take it or fight. And so Ed said, uh, "I'll uh, no, that's it. Okay, well, what are you going to give me?" And they, they gave him a certain percentage. And that basically is the, del, the, the, the death knell of the Purple Gang. This is 1935. Harry Millman, 1937. So with the end, with the Purple Gang uh, and the end of Prohibition, and they're basically, they're each going out on their own. Um, he shook down uh, prostitution places and other places that were protected by the East Side Gang. And he then get, he also in, in uh, the fall of 1936 gets into a, a fight with one of the East Side Gangs, Joe Bomarito. And he beats him up to the point that Bomarito literally is unconscious. And this is for the East Side Gang, summer of 1936. They say, you don't do that. You don't show that kind of disrespect to a made man. And they contact a Bernstein and Bernstein says, okay, you can take Harry out. Well, they try a couple of times. This is one. In 1937, in August, um, Harry's at a uh, blind pig. He goes out and says uh, to the, the uh, doorman, can you get my car? Get my LaSalle, the old LaSalle. And uh, the doorman gets in the car and it blows up and the doorman is killed. He's an African-American man who's actually only 39 years old at the time. And um, so this is an attempt by the Italian mob to get Harry. And this is August of 1937. And then in November of 1937, Harry is in the Weskies Deli on the corner of 12th Street and I think that's Charlevoix. Um, Millman is drinking. By the way, Millman drank whiskey and Coke. Uh, he's drinking with various PG, uh, Purple Gang members. About 1 a.m., two guys come in, buy a drink, buy a, a shot, each go, each throw the shot down, pull out their pistols, and one up, ran over and killed Harry and a couple of the guys that he was with, a couple of his crew at that point. Um, about 10 sh shots were used to do it. And it was felt that these were two men, not from the Purple Gang, but brought in from New York, from the beginnings of Murder Incorporated. He took these kind of photos back then. Died of multiple gunshot wounds. It actually says that on his uh, death certificate. And um, at this point, the police and the press are saying that the Purple Gang is officially defunct. And the Detroit News headline reads, Bullets write gangs long overdue obituary. At this point by, 90, by 37, any of the purple gang that are left really are working for the Italian gang and the Billman killing, which is the last of that. Okay, there's one more. So 1945 comes around and you say, well, wait a minute, what's 1945 have to do? It has to do with this. Senator Warren Hop, Hooper, excuse me, was a senator, a state senator from Albion and he had discovered corruption in the Republican Party, and he was going to testify on January the 14th. On January the 13th, his car was stopped on the road outside of Albion at five o'clock in the afternoon. It was a winter day, obviously, and two men jumped out of the sedan, ran over, 
and with three shots killed Senator Hooper. He, they didn't want him testifying about the corruption in the Republican Party. And who, who did it? Ray Bernstein and Harry Keywell, who were in Jackson prison at that time. The prison was so corrupt that, that in 1945, that the, the warden actually allowed um, the Purple Gang, uh, Ray Bernstein and Harry Keywell, to take their car, stop Hooper's car, kill him. They return to the prison and get their regular prison clothes on, and no one is ever charged with this. But it was the Purple Gang. It's the last thing they did. Harry, uh, Harry Keywell and Ray Bernstein. So what happens to the, the famous Bernsteins? And as the, so after prohibition and the, the, the um, gang has really died, he goes into gambling, he Bernstein does. Lives in the Cadillac, the book, the book Cadillac that we know today. He lived in the penthouse there for almost 30 years from 1939 to 1968. Spent a lot of his time trying to get uh, Ray out of prison. Um, Abe actually was married in 1924 and, there's, and then he was divorced in 1934 and his, wife uh, listed uh, extreme cruelty and failure to support her in the divorce certificate in 1934. Uh, he died in 1968 at the age of 77 and he's buried in Bethel of the Jewish cemetery in Livonia on Six Mile. Joe Bernstein goes to California, first to Miami and then to California. He does get married and uh, Joe has uh, does not have any children, gets married to a woman uh, named Marguerite Ball, and uh, goes out to California. He dies in 1984 at the age of 84, he claimed, although he was actually, well, he was 84 at the time. Uh, and he's buried in a Catholic cemetery, St. Patrick's Cemetery in El Dorado County, California. Um, did not have any children, but he was married. Ray, we've heard about, he gets out of prison in uh, 63 because of, a, in 64 because of a stroke. Uh, the previous year and dies in 1966 and was never married, never had any kids. Izzy Bernstein. Izzy is, this is a picture of him in 1940, still in Detroit, still in the rackets. He gets involved with a uh, oil company after uh, prohibition. And he's one of the, he's the only Bernstein again, who actually gets, goes through high school. He got married in 1932 in Ohio. Uh, died in 1969 at the age of 63. He does have a daughter and named Sarah, and she actually died in 1977. Uh, but he's also buried in a Jewish cemetery in Ferndale, uh, Beth de Filo in, Bern in Ferndale. Last thing, is there anything left of the, uh, the Bernstein days? And yes, it says the Oakland Health Club. This was a place that had steam baths and pools. It was not owned by the Purples, but they were hanging out in it regularly. It was about three blocks south of the Pearls, of the uh, Oakland Sugar House. Opened in 1930. Um, it was their hangout. The Purples were there. Then the Mafia came in at a later time. Guess what? It's still open. This is it today. The Oakland Bathhouse. The Shivitz. This is a photo that was taken in, in well, this was taken actually in the 60s, but the building is still there. And they have pool, the steam bath. And um, they are open. There was an article in, in the Detroit News in the uh, earlier, in, in 2020. And they have a co -ed, they have basically separate men's and women's. And you can also have parties there. I've seen videos of what's going on there. Um, it is closed now because of COVID, but otherwise it, it is, open. it is open in that sense. Just a reminder, Township, uh, North Hill Township, HDC, the Historic District Commission. Here is the website, uh, North Hill Township Historic District Historic Fund and the North Hill Township Historic Fund and on Facebook. And that is the end. So if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. We did have a few questions in the chat for you, Joe. Okay. First, there's a compliment admiring your purple shirt. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, we have a very astute audience. Ah, um, good. Uh, secondly, Suzanne wonders if you've seen the 1960 movie, The Purple Gang with Robert Blake. 
I have not seen it. Um, I, I've read about it. I had a slide to put in, but this, I thought this was getting too long and it obviously is. So I've gone over an hour with you guys. But uh, yeah, I've seen the movie. I'm sorry, I haven't seen the movie, but I am aware of it, yes. Robert Blake basically pay, played one of the Bernstein brothers in it. How, how do I? Frankie is wondering, when he moved here in the 80s, there was a stucco style building on the southwest corner of Newburgh and Seven Mile. And was that connected to the Purple Gang at all, as he was told? Mm, well, not that I know of. Um, I'm aware also, I was recently asked, actually, Wendy asked me for, uh, someone had asked her about uh, a golf club that was uh, supposedly on uh, at Newburgh and Seven Mile. There were actually probably two golf courses, two, two golf courses there, maybe three, it's not clear. And one of the oral histories through the library talks about um, a golf course possibly being built uh, with Purple Gang money uh, in the in 27 or so. 27 is early for the Purple Gang to have that kind of money to put out. Uh, but he, this gentleman that did the oral history also said, though, that a man came from California. Now, one of the Purple Gangs is was Joey. Joey was in California, as was Izzy. They both were in California together and lived out their life there basically together and were buried in different places. But other than that, and it's possible that somebody came, but I, I, from what I've seen of the Purple Gang, it's really a question that they would have built something like that with in 1927 or even in 30. By 31, the, the gang's going down and it's only the Bernsteins that have that kind of money to do it. So it's possible, but I don't know that, I, I can't say that there was definitely a connection. Okay, Norm wonders, Mount Oliver Cemetery in Detroit is supposed to be where the majority of the Purple's Black Hand and Mafia and his family members are buried. Is that true? Not from my, what I found out. The Purple Gang guys uh, were all Jewish and they were buried in the ones that I've shown you tonight were all buried in Jewish cemeteries. The, uh, the Italian gang, that, that the, uh, the East Side gang, that's possible, yeah. I've heard that, that something similar to that said, so that's very possible. But I would not say the Purple Gang because again, they were Jewish men and their families took them and buried them in Jewish cemeteries. Someone would like to know if women were involved with the gang's activities or were any caught in the crossfire? Uh, no, most of the guys were married. A. Baxler and um, uh, Eddie Fletcher were both married. Um, and there, there was actually, an, there is an article that's available uh, where um, A. Baxler's wife was involved in, was, they have pictures of her leaving like different places after the funeral. I'm sorry, after, after the killing was done, but they were taken back to New York and buried. Um, other than that, no. Um, I, other than, I was surprised to find that A. A. Bernstein was married because um, there was no talk of it at all and in anything else. And, but the actual document shows his, the divorce that his wife uh, applied for uh, and that she it, put there extreme cruelty. Well, the guys were cruel with other guys. I didn't think they were with women, but uh, and Al Capone, I don't know if you know, Al Capone was married and his wife stuck with him through the whole thing. She outlived him. She just by a few, by a month or so, she died in 47 also, like he did. Um, but other than that, women, no. Kevin and Donna Kurt wonder if you could comment on Sammy Kurt, K-E-R-T. Sammy Purple? Kurt is his last name. Kurtz. Uh, I don't know that. I've not heard that name. Are you, do you, have, do you know that there's some connection with the Purple Gang? They add anything to the chat. Uh, until then, Tor Brown would like to know, she was told that the Alden Towers and Colony Arms apartments in Detroit were used by Purple Gang during Prohibition. Is that correct? That could be. They lived in various apartments. Uh, different names would come up. The only two that I know for sure are the Miller Flores, which were you know, gang, uh, killing setups and uh, murder setups, and then the Collingwood. But yeah, they, they lived in various apartments. Uh, there wasn't, there were some that they, two or three of them would live there, but there was no specific place where they lived in. Yeah, it's very possible. Any, anything that was around in the 20s, in like that, that territory north of 
I-94 and east and west of I-75, because that was then, again, Hastings, and that was, that was their area that they came from. And back to the Northville connection, Fred Chateau was chiming in that it was the Northville Golf Club. Oh, the Northville Golf Club, yeah, rather than Northville Hills, Northville Golf, Golf Club, yeah. That was over there. I haven't been able, I've been trying to figure out which corner it was on because you can't see anything now. And, and I had in my head the eight, eight mile in Newburg, Newburg where there is still a, on the east side of uh, Newburg, uh, on the south side of eight mile, there's still a golf club, but I, I've been able, not been able to figure out exactly where the golf club was in 27. I haven't seen any, looked at any maps yet to figure out where it was. Cause there, again, there was possibly three. Well, Sally is chiming in and saying her aunt always said the Northville Hills golf course was built by the Purple Gang, never finished nor operated by them. So it was built by them, but it was never finished or operated by them. Right. Okay, that that may be. I'm not aware that that happened. Is there any truth to the fact that the Purple Gang had anything to do with the Lindbergh child kidnapping? No. Uh, I can say that quickly because there's an extensive article that was just written in a Michigan Historical Review, which is a um, Michigan magazine on history, and it goes on and on and on. And the, uh, uh, the thinking, I think, at the time was if there were people that were trying to get the Purples, uh, the, it may be the Purples themselves that got their names in to just because they were trying to get Ray out of prison in 1932. He was in prison in 1931, and they were trying to use connections. And, but there was actually no connection with the purple at all. Any connection with the Cliff Bells? Cliff? Bells. The Bells. downtown Detroit. Mm, not that I know of, but again, there were a lot of places they went. Any place that was a blind pig, they would have likely going to have been, been in it in Detroit. Which And it, assuming, and Cliff's is a bar, right? I've heard the name, but I'm not sure, right? gang member was at the Hoko and which years was that? Oh, uh, Phil, Philip Keywell. Um, he, in, in 1950, he's in Jackson. In 1950, around 1950, he becomes a trustee. Somehow he gets himself transferred to the Hoko. And the Hoko was the place where, the, where Mayberry used some of its prisoners and to run the farm. And so he ends up running the chicken farm at uh, Mayberry, at Mayberry Sanatorium. And that's basically where, where you see the, 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 the barns today. That's, that's where the farm was. And uh, so Phil gets himself there and then somebody finds out about it and they say, oh no, two things. One, we don't want this, this horrible criminal who's been in prison for years and years for murdering three people. And the other thing is, how did he get here when he's this terrible criminal? And he goes back to Jackson pretty quickly. But he was the head of the, the, uh, the uh, chicken farm at Mayberry Sanatorium, which again is what we know as the Mayberry Farm today on 8 Mile. We have a few more if you have the time. Okay. Sure. Okay. sure. Dr. Don says, one of his uncles was killed in the early 30s. Family legend says it was the Purple Gang, but the Purple Gang was out of business by then, according mm -hmm. to you. No, 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 it. no, it wasn't out of business. It wasn't out of business, but it was winding down, depending on how early in the 30s. If it's 35, mm, probably not. But if it's 31, 32, maybe 33, then yeah, it's very possible gentleman was Russell Rocker and the death certificate says five bullets in the head. Have you five. heard that name? Rocker? Rocker? Mm -hmm. uh, no, but he could have been one of the Purple Gang. I've never seen any kind of, as I said, this detective had this list of 49 people he had kept when he retired in 32 and the Purple Gang is sliding down at that point. Uh, but I've never seen a, a list. I don't rock R-O-C-K-E-R. But I've, I've never heard that name, but it's very possible it happened. And if you have the death certificate, yeah, that could be. Uh, uh, I'd recommend if I'd recommend him 
searching the free press of that period, which library, right? Yeah, that's a good idea. Carol says she has cottage on Lake Osavo, and the word is those two the two cottages there were for the Purple Gang. Any idea of a cottage? Couldn't, I, I couldn't give a def, definite, but it's very possible because they didn't just stay in Detroit all the time. I showed you a couple places where they were. So yeah, but again, if you're getting beyond 33, 1933, and when these places were built or something like that, then that's not the Purple Gang. They're not, they're not big enough to be out there all over the place. Between 28 and 33 is really when they're, they're really the biggest. Sammy Kirk. He was one of the two Sammies. You know, the two the, Sammies. The two. Sammy Purple. There's also a Sam Bernstein. Not relate, not technically not related to the original Burns, the, the four brothers. I, I, I didn't hear the rest of the question. Oh, Sammy Kirk, we asked before, he was one of the two Sammies. Yeah, that's true. Sammy Purple, and then Sam Bernstein. Those are the two Sammies. But other than being called the two Sammies, they didn't do everything together like the Sammies twins did. Was that the question? We'll move on. How about that? Okay. okay. All right. Did any of the Purple Gang actually practice Judaism? No. Not that I'm aware of. We're stuck on the golf club, unfortunately. <laughs> There's a lot of chatter about that going on. So, okay. All right. Well, if you, Joe, do you want to share your email address if people have questions for sure. you that they didn't get to today? Yes. My email is Z as in zebra, E and as echo, as Z E D, Z zebra, E echo, D delta. 796 at gmail.com. Joe, so this isn't a question, but I have a comment. Yeah. Um, my, I grew up up in Manistee, and uh, after Senator Hooper was killed, his wife moved up there with her children oh. to, just to get away from the downstate and be oh. kind of safe and on the down low, and was a good friend of my mother in Manistee. That's great. It's good news that I'm glad that they were able to move on with their life after that. Yeah, that was bad. He was only in his 30s, I think, at the time. Nice job. Thank you. Oh, Joe, repeat your email for me. I'll put it in the chat. Z796 at, at gmail.com. And someone's being funny. They wonder if the Z in your email stands for <laughs> Ziggy Fingers. <laughs> no. No relation. No. <laughs> um, I made up that email. I what, a year, many years ago. I had Hotmail, and I got uh, hacked. And so I decided, well, I'm going to put a, uh, I'm going to make an email that really doesn't show my name. I think a lot of people. If you look at this, there's certain things in the email that you can say, well, I think that's so-and-so that I, and, and so I just picked one out of the air and 796 popped into my head in ZED. So it's just made up totally. It has no, no relationship to Ziggy. Yeah, Ziggy fingers. Yeah, cut off the guy's finger for the, for the ring. All right. Well, thank you. We had a very good crowd and I think some very good feedback for you in the chat. I'll send you a a copy of it so you can review it but thanks a lot joe appreciate you you're welcome Anyone else thank hey, you very uh, much thank you thanks joe good job thank you Great job. Thanks, Joe.